a Russian passenger jet crashes into the Volga River. Rescuers are stunned to discover that the plane was carrying some of the country's most famous athletes. I'm Gallimore. The Yaroslav Lokomotiv hockey team is decimated. Nearly the entire team is dead. How can that happen to a team of such young, talented, healthy guys that had so much to offer? The president of Russia demands answers. The Russian government was put in pressure, and the investigators trying to get results. Why didn't they lift off? Investigators need to know Rotate. why the jet struggled to get off the ground. That can be the moment, the split second, when you might have chosen life versus death. Look what happened here. The reason is almost too simple to believe. What are you doing? Mayday, mayday. September the 7th, 2011, a Yak-42 jet descends towards a Russian airport on its way to pick up some very important passengers. They were reliable Soviet-built airplanes that could land on shorter runways and uh, extend that airline service to smaller airports. This charter flight is operated by Yak Service Airlines. Only the crew is on board. Flaps 30. First Officer Igor Zhivyelov, is the airline's vice president of flight operations. In his nearly 30 years of flying, he's racked up more than 13,000 hours in the air. Flaps are 30. Beside him is Captain Andrei Solomensev, one of his closest friends. Get down. Flight engineer Vladimir Matushin rounds out the three-man cockpit crew. Get down three green. Mechanic Alexander Sizov flies with the plane to make sure it's in good working order at all times. It's important to get people from A to B uh, with uh, obviously safe operation and, and good service. In the charter world, maybe more so because this is the reputation of the company. Will they call us again? The plane is just moments from landing at Yaroslavl, a city 250 kilometers northeast of Moscow. Touchdown into Yaroslavl. It was a little bit rough touchdown, a bounce landing followed. Oh, <laughs> a little heavy there. I must be nervous. The president may be watching. <laughs> Yaroslavl's airport is under tight security. Some of Russia's top politicians are attending an economic forum in town. But it's not politicians who are preparing to board the plane. It is another prestigious group of passengers, the Yaroslavl Lokomotiv hockey team, one of the most beloved sports teams in all of Russia. Their fans were fantastic. They were loud in support of their team, and they let you know when you were the opposing team. Mike Fountain is a former National Hockey League goalie who has played against Lokomotiv in Russia. It created quite the atmosphere. Whenever you went to that city, it was, it's a hockey town. They loved it. Hockey is a religion in Russia. People love hockey. People love hockey players. There are celebrities. There are stars. Alexander Galimov is a right winger who has played for Lokomotiv his entire career. Born in Yaroslavl, he's a local hero. Hey, coach. This guy's like me on the fourth check. Canadian Brad McCrimmon was an all-star NHL defenseman and assistant coach. Now at age 52, he's looking forward to his first regular season game as a head coach in Russia. For a coach like Brad McCrimmon with his record, being an assistant coach with the Red Wings and his playing career, for him to go over to a team like Yaroslav with the passion those fans have, I guarantee you he was so excited to have that opportunity to go and win that first game. Some of Russia's best players are on this team, including team captain Ivan Kachenko. I had the opportunity to play against Ivan Tachenko for many years. 
He's a fantastic hockey player, and uh, he's one of those guys that was always in front of you in the game, always getting an opportunity to score. In the preseason, Lokomotiv has been on a hot streak, winning seven of nine preseason games. Fans believe this year they have a very good shot at winning the Gagarin Cup. They want you to win the championship. That cup, it's a big deal. Hungry? <laughs> this year, we win it all. Really? Yeah. <laughs> As a VP with the airline, First Officer Zhivyelov has managed to pull rank in order to fly with some of his heroes. For this flight, Captain Solomonsev will take the controls while Zhivyelov handles the radio calls. The call sign to Noshna, Yaroslav. Yaroslav 42434, request engine start. 42434, clear to start. The crew starts the Yaks three engines. Start number three. And adjusts the plane's stabilizer for takeoff. How much for you? Nine? Mm, maybe eight, I think. Eight and a half. Flaps and slats in position. The flight is bound for Minsk, two hours away in Belarus. For the players, it's the first of many flights they will have to make this season. The hockey players are the same over in Russia as North America. We've got the jokesters on the team. You've got the guys that will maybe sit in the corner, be a little more quiet. You've got the, the guys that maybe went out a little too much the night before and has a story for you. And it, it's kind of funny how that is an international thing. Checking the flight controls. Start complete. Thrust set. On September the 7th, 2011, just before four in the afternoon, the plane starts down the runway. Crew are taking off. V1 is 190. The flight engineer watches the gauges. It's his job to advise the captain when the plane reaches takeoff speed. The engine power should determine just how fast you get, and if it's done properly and the flaps and slats are set right, you will have the right, right lift generated by the speed to get you off the ground safely, as almost always happens. Rotate. The flight engineer called rotate, and the captain displaced the yoke to rotate the elevators up to about 10 degrees. This would have been sufficient for uh, creating that takeoff attitude and the airplane lifting off. But the plane stays on the ground. Nothing happened. The airplane did not react in any way to the displacement of the yoke. 210. Full power. The captain calls for full power. And again, nothing happens to the aircraft. Some of the passengers sense trouble. Planes in Russia are not up to European and North American standards. And it's a, it's a little bit a little bit scary for North American and European players going over there. The runway is 3,000 meters long. The crew must lift off before the 2,600 meter mark, or they won't be able to stop safely. The progress has stabilized are too low. That's up. Adjusting the stabilizer doesn't help. What's happening? You'll be fine. The plane has enough speed and should get airborne. 220. But instead of lifting off, the Yak-42 keeps going past the end of the runway. Going off the runway at the end of a takeoff roll is always dangerous. Full tank of gas, uh, people are still confused. You don't know how far the clear spacing goes. This is a nightmare for every pilot because now the airplane is not flying and yet you're moving across the ground at 142 miles an hour. What are you doing? The crew struggles desperately to get the plane off the ground. Finally, they succeed.
The plane is airborne, but not out of trouble. Yak Service Flight 9633 isn't able to climb. The pilots have lost control. The Yak-42 crashes into the Volga River, less than a kilometer from the end of the runway. Local police patrolling the river are the first to reach the wreck. Star player Alexander Galimov has survived the crash. No, it's okay. Help the others. Mechanic Alexander Sizov is also alive. Over here! Help! Please! Rescuers are shocked to learn the plane was carrying some of Russia's most famous athletes. Thank you. I'm Galimov. Twisted wreckage burns near the river's edge. <laughs> Witnesses record the horrific scene minutes after impact. Onlookers see no sign of more survivors through the thick black smoke. Dmitry Pushkov is a hospital pathologist who rushes to the scene. When we arrived at the crash site, the ground was burned black. Small pieces of wreckage and clothing fragments were everywhere. And in the middle of the field, the bodies of the dead hockey players were stacked. The smell of kerosene was very strong. It tastes sweet. I'll remember it forever. Within hours, Russian investigators are also at the scene. They must figure out what caused this accident. Uh, excuse me. We'll be taking charge here now. James Oberg is an aviation consultant and former NASA engineer. The investigation team had had a lot of experience, uh, sadly, because there have been many accidents. But that experience, as it turned out, turned out to be critical to actually finding the cause of, of this particular accident. Their first challenge is to secure the site. Get these people out of here. News of the tragedy spread through the city, and fans, as well as regular people, wanted to see. Few could believe it, so they wanted to see what happened and say goodbye to the hockey players. Of the 45 people who boarded the flight, 43 are dead, including the pilots. The locomotive hockey team has been all but wiped out. This was a tragedy for everyone in Yaroslavl. Lots of people knew these guys, not just as hockey players, but personally. That's why everybody took this loss very hard. Hungry? Alexander Galimov and the mechanic Alexander Sizov are the only two survivors. They are both put into medically induced comas. I knew that once I checked the, the players list, I knew I would know players on that team. And it was, it was, uh, it was a tough feeling. Around the world, there's shock at the news. This is one of the biggest tragedies in the history of sport. I think the, the reaction uh, across the world was first of shock, disbelief. Uh, you know, how can that happen to a team of such young, talented, healthy, good family guys that had so much to offer? In Moscow, fans are stunned when a grim announcement interrupts the Continental Hockey League season opening game. Игроки просили принести вам извинения, что the president of the KHL actually stopped a game that was in progress after he heard about the accident, which was a very touching move. More than 20 people saw the plane's failed takeoff attempt. 
So what happened? Because the team is so well loved, everyone wants answers. Investigators focus in on a key question. Why couldn't the Yak-42 lift off the runway? Three factors are essential for takeoff. First is engine power. You need enough thrust to reach takeoff speed. Second is lift. The wing flaps must be properly extended to increase aerodynamic lift. And finally, to achieve the proper angle, the plane's horizontal stabilizer must be angled, putting downward force on the tail and lifting the nose. The investigators examined the wreckage, looking for anything that might reveal if the plane was not properly configured for takeoff. Well, it looks like flaps were set at 20. On your way down the runway, if your flaps and slats aren't set properly, you may get too much drag. It's, it's a sweet spot of those settings, and they have to be in that region. If they are beyond that region, they will not do what you want. In fact, they'll do things you don't want. The flaps on the wings seem to be correctly extended for takeoff. On the tail, the horizontal stabilizer also appears to be properly deflected. Oh, it looks fine. Everything appeared to be normal in terms of the lift. Investigators find nothing to suggest the engines weren't providing enough thrust to get the plane off the ground. You would look at the settings of the engines, the quality of the jet fuel, and those are the things you would look at first, and they did look at them first. Confirmation of the engine performance can only come from the plane's flight data recorder. It's one of two black boxes that record every detail of the flight. They may hold the key to understanding exactly what happened, but they've been submerged in the Volga River. Before they can be analyzed, they must be slowly and carefully dried out. OK. Take them to Moscow immediately. Why the pilots of Flight 9633 could not lift off the runway remains a mystery. There's a second, equally puzzling question. Why didn't they abort the takeoff at the first hint of trouble? The question then is, what decisions should the crew have made? When would they have known enough to choose to abort the takeoff? Meanwhile, a day after one of his nation's worst tragedies, Russian President Dmitry Medvedev visits the crash site. It was high profile because obviously very famous club and any loss of life is tragic, in aviation especially. And, and as I mentioned before, hockey is, is a main sport in Russia, if you will. And if you talk to Russian people, they, they would tell you, we lost, we lost part of a family. 2011 has been a dismal year for Russian aviation. The Yaroslavl accident is the eighth fatal crash so far. Less than three months earlier, 47 people died near an airport 650 kilometers north of Moscow. Rus Air Flight 9605 slammed into a highway while coming in for a landing late at night. The Yaroslavl disaster has drawn critical attention from around the world. President Medvedev announces that radical changes are needed in Russian aviation. The pressure on a team to investigate this and find the correct answer to it is always high. But when the president of the country comes out and says you're going to have to do it right because the country needs an answer, I'm sure they felt the whole weight of their whole country and of the families of all the victims uh, looming over them. We need to work faster. Investigators desperately need to know what happened during the final moments of Flight 9633. They catch a break when they learn that an airport security camera off the end of the runway recorded the Yak-42 as it finally lifted off. The grainy image could provide a crucial lead. Whoa, whoa. Can you play that again? The video shows that the plane was properly configured for takeoff. But beyond that, it holds no new information, no clue to what went wrong. OK, they started here. They lifted off here. The plane only needed 1,200 meters to get off the ground. They had about 2,800 plus 
meters of runway available. That's more than twice the distance they should need. Something kept the plane on the ground when it should have lifted off. The persistent question for investigators is what? They think the plane might simply have been too heavy. Aside from being hard to get in the air if you weigh more, and anything that weighs more is going to be harder to accelerate. It's a lesson that was learned nearly nine years earlier in Charlotte, North Carolina. All 21 people aboard a commuter plane died when it crashed and burst into flames less than a minute after takeoff. The plane was 263 kilograms above the allowed maximum. Weight was also considered a key factor in the US Army's deadliest peacetime crash. On Arrow Air Flight 1285, the weight of 248 soldiers equipped with heavy gear was underestimated. Their DC-8 fell from the sky 900 meters beyond the end of the runway in Gander, Newfoundland. Everyone on board was killed. If uh, the weight is underestimated or not calculated at all, you, don't, you just don't have that clear picture of what exactly to expect from the airplane. They didn't know their weight. Concerns over the takeoff weight increase when investigators learned that Yak service had no scales for weighing baggage at Yaroslavl's airport. There was no way to weigh the gear, the luggage and the cargo that would be loaded in the airplane, so it was estimated. But when investigators estimate the weight of the team and their baggage, they conclude that the plane was not too heavy. The weight is under the limit. Even with all the hockey gear, the plane was still safely under its maximum weight. It does not appear that was a contributing issue on this in this case, but it shows that the crew was not properly preparing the information they would need during the takeoff roll. If the problem wasn't weight, it may have been speed. Investigators returned to the engines. Using the plane's estimated weight, they determined that the speed needed for takeoff was 215 kilometers an hour. Did they ever get to 215? If the engines weren't working properly, it could explain the disaster. It's very fortunate that the flight data recorders were both recovered and, and functional. And that isn't a universal factor in modern Russian aviation. The speed question is resolved when investigators check the FDR data. They find that the engines had powered the plane well beyond takeoff speed. Engines are working. Investigators are baffled. They can find no reason for the failed takeoff. And why didn't they lift off? The airplane should fly. The airplane wants to fly. In fact, at 210 kilometers per hour, with the stabilizer set at 7 degrees, the Yak-42 will rotate on its own. On September the 10th, 2011, Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin attends a memorial for the locomotive players, along with 40,000 grieving fans. Two days later, Alexander Galimov, the last remaining member of one of Russia's best hockey teams, dies from his injuries. The Yaroslavl tragedy has now claimed 44 lives. With an entire nation mourning the loss of so many young athletes, the air crash investigation team is under intense pressure to deliver answers. The Russian government was uh, putting pressure on the investigators trying to, to get results, to get to the truth, what exactly was happening. Investigators scour the flight data recording, desperate for clues. Finally, they spot something unusual. Look at the acceleration. Despite full power from the engines, the Yak-42 did not accelerate as quickly as it should. During the takeoff roll, when the aircraft should be continuously accelerating, it was actually slowing down toward the end of the roll. And slowing down is a, is a bizarre, and unusual, and potentially fatal development. It could be the lead investigators have been hoping for, 
If they can explain the bizarre drop in acceleration, they may finally know what killed the celebrated team and the crew. Investigators can't figure out what could have caused Flight 9633 to lose speed at a critical moment. Could the brakes be on? Crew were taking cover. It's a bizarre possibility, but having the brakes on might explain the plane's unusual behavior. Something was breaking the aircraft at a time when everything else was trying to speed it up. To confirm their theory, investigators conduct a test at the Gromov Flight Research Institute near Moscow. The length of the runway at Gromov is um, probably around 5,000 meters or so. It, it's very long. It, it is suited for test flying. A test pilot will recreate the flight exactly using data from the FDR. First, they try the flight with no brakes applied. We have a rotation speed. The test plane lifts off easily just 1,200 meters down the runway. Then they try the flight again. This time puts the brake on. They gradually applied the wheel brakes to, to, to slow the aircraft down as you're attempting to take off. With the brakes on, the plane still has enough power to take off. But the distance needed to reach takeoff speed more than doubles. What the flight test indicated was that the four sets of brakes in the landing gear were activated and we're actively slowing down the aircraft as it's rolling down the runway. The test flight evidence is compelling. It now seems almost certain that the Yak-42 powered down the runway with its brakes on. Rotate. The puzzling question is why? A bizarre situation, and explaining it was, was, was a real challenge. Investigators listen to the cockpit voice recording from Flight 9633. OK, go ahead. They hope the crew's conversation can help explain how and why the plane's brakes were activated during takeoff. Brakes. Check off the left, flashing. Check off the left, flashing. They hear the crew check the brakes before takeoff. The brake test was fine. It appears that the crew had no concerns about their brakes at the start of the flight. Investigators now wonder if the braking system malfunctioned and activated the brakes in error after the plane began to move. From the media coverage, we know that uh, there were problems with braking system. There is definitely a possibility. Digging into the history of brake malfunction on the Yak-42, the investigative team makes a disturbing find. There have been at least five previous incidents involving faulty brakes. But things went really, really south after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and a lot of safety measures and normal training and talented people all went by the wayside. To better understand what went wrong with the brakes, investigators send the wheel assemblies out for testing. While they wait for results, they shift their focus to another unanswered question. Why did they keep trying to get in the air long after? In hindsight, it was clear they should not have. Perhaps the cockpit recording will explain the crew's decision to continue their troubled takeoff. Full power. Investigators listen for the captain to announce their abort speed, also known as V1. Once the airplane approaches, a V1 speed, a captain of the aircraft needs to make a decision to either continue takeoff or abort takeoff. But as they approach the critical speed, crew were taking off, V1 is 190. The recording reveals a disturbing exchange. We need 200 for V1. No, the R is 200. We hear the captain announcing 190 kilometers per hour as a V1 speed and he's corrected by the flight engineer. No air crew should be debating critical speeds during a takeoff run. They didn't know their abort speed. The abort speed should have been determined before the plane even started to move. OK, let me, let me hear the briefing. The departure briefing is a very important part of the flight. It is done and conducted by the captain. Um, it has to be recorded on the cockpit voice recorder. 
The patch procedure run away heading 300. Transition altitude is 700 meters. Take a captain typically informs his crew of the proper abort speed in a briefing before takeoff. Uh, prior to reaching a speed off, <coughs> we will reject the takeoff. When he comes down to the uh, V1 speed, it's impossible to distinguish what exactly he's saying. Investigators suspect the crew did not hear a V1 speed either. Prior to reaching a speed off, <coughs> The three men never agreed on the speed at which they could no longer safely abort takeoff. If you don't have your pre-planned criteria set up, like the V-speed, like other factors in the aircraft, you don't have the one measurable gate that can tell you at this point that you're good or not good. Rotate. Had they rejected takeoff, three to five seconds after attempting to rotate, they would have still stopped in the clear way, and everybody would have just walked away. Instead, they try to troubleshoot the problem. The power reset stabilizer is too low. Add some. Until they run out of runway. Calculations show that from the time the pilots first attempted to lift off, they had five seconds to decide whether to stop. They had time to stop. They allowed themselves to get to the point where they no longer wanted to abort and would rather have continued on, which they did. In the cockpit, there was a feel that the airplane is going to get airborne any second now. Any second, we'll, 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 a little bit more, a little bit more speed, a little bit more speed, and we're going to lift off. Investigators conclude that continuing the takeoff was a fatal error by the crew. They can only speculate why they did. Perhaps the pilots felt pressure to get their prestigious passengers to their destination on time. The crew, of course, was trying to do their best and uh, perform this mission. Take them for their opening game of the season. If you have a maintenance delay, it doesn't quite look good on your company. Will they call you again? I don't know, maybe not. Meanwhile, results from the brake system analysis are in. There's no evidence of mechanical failure. The brakes were fine. They calculated that having them actually fail independently, accidentally, all together, the odds were literally a billion to one, which will never happen. The finding moves the investigation closer to a disturbing conclusion. One of the pilots must have applied the brakes himself. We need to take a closer look at the crew. Investigators know that if they announce the crew was at fault, the public will question their motives. There is a very common cultural thread in Russia of blaming the people present for something that goes wrong. Uh, it helps to insulate those who put them there, or those whose decisions put them there, uh, keeps them blameless. Few are willing to believe that one of the two experienced pilots could have accidentally had his foot on the brakes during takeoff. Many eyebrows got raised within the Russian airline industry. We know that the first officer was a very distinguished pilot, and he had almost 13,000 hours as a first officer and a captain. But a review of the crew's flight records offers up a clue. Both pilots routinely trained on and flew two different versions of the Yak plane. The Yak-40 is a much older regional jet. Introduced in 1968, it carries up to 32 passengers. The larger Yak-42 made its first flight in 1980. With a swept wing design and more powerful turbofan engines, it can carry three times as many passengers and fly longer routes. Both pilots were more experienced on the Yak-40 jet, but they also flew the Yak-42, depending on which was available. At most airlines, pilots are not allowed to switch from one type of plane to another. It is improper and um, incorrect to train a pilot to fly two airplanes at the same time. It's beginning to look like the crew's habit of flying two different but similar planes may have led to confusion in the cockpit. Focusing in on the brake pedals, investigators spot a small but potentially significant difference. I want to see those pedals. The Yak-40 brake pedal cups the pilot's entire foot. But the Yak-42 is designed so the pilot's heel rests on the floor. 
They were flying back and forth, these two different kinds of aircraft, which happened to have different ways of putting your, their feet on the brake pedal. And that was in the, when the aha started to appear. A pilot accustomed to flying the Yak-40 might have placed his whole foot on the pedal, a mistake that could have activated the brakes. If you rest your feet on the Yak-42 pedals, just like you would in the Yak-40, it is possible to create a pressure on the top part of the pedal and activate the wheel brakes. It is possible. While such an error could, in theory, account for the accident, investigators still have questions. They can't understand why a pilot wouldn't notice his mistake right away. You'd have to put about 10, 15, 20 pounds of pressure onto the pedals. And that, 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 that is a significant weight. You would think a person would feel that. It's not until they examine the crew's medical records that a possible explanation emerges. First officer Igor Zhivyelov had secretly been treated for a nerve condition. He should not have been certified to fly. The first officer had a neurological condition where the extremities sort of lose sensitivity. He was losing the sensations in his legs. It was a medical development, it was a slow development, it didn't make him fall down, but it made him less aware of feedback from feelings in his feet. So the argument was made that the first officer could have been pressing on the brake pedals without even realizing it. Uh, look, look what happened here. It seems that the brakes affected the plane's flight in more than one way. Football. The brakes didn't just slow the plane down, they also kept the nose from lifting up. It's going to pitch you down. Because you are being pushed by engines that are above the brakes, it's going to give the aircraft a nose down pitch. Engaging brakes on a rotating wheel creates a downward force on the nose. It acted on the Yak-42 almost like glue, sticking the plane to the runway. Probably set stabilizer too low. That's up. The crew's attempts to get the nose up only made matters worse once they were off the ground. At that point, the braking force of contact of the tires with the runway now stops. And all the other forces that you've been putting into the aircraft, pulling back on the yoke, elevator trim, flaps, just to get the nose up, they are now no longer counteracted by the nose down force of the braking. The aircraft immediately goes into a, a nose up high pitch rate, 20 degrees up in about two seconds, and you can't stay in the air. The sudden nose-up attitude causes the wings to quickly lose lift. Drag increases, the speed drops, the plane goes into a stall. And you're just a big hunk of metal and fuel and flesh just falling through the air. While digging further into the pilot's records, investigators make another astonishing discovery. Oh, whoa. So he didn't complete the training? In the training reports of the two pilots, it was discovered that in many cases, they had been certified as having accomplished certain flight tasks and flight challenges, such as poor visibility, bad weather flying, when they hadn't. When the captain went through training, then it was sort of put on hold and then went through training again, and then switched employers. But the training was done inconsistently with, uh, with breaks in between. Some of the training documentation for the first officer was not even available. How much were you? Nine? Maybe eight, I think. Eight and a half. The crew, while highly experienced, lacked the correct training to fly the Yak-42. The Federal Air Transport Agency immediately suspends the operating license of Yak Service Airlines. Uh, the fleet was grounded and Yak Service as a company was closed. It was the people who had set up that disaster by not properly training them, by not properly uh, assigning them, and by a whole series of, of regulatory failures and procedural failures that set up this accident. There is one final revelation which helps investigators understand the precise steps involved in this accident. Data from the flight recorders shows the crew made another critical error just seconds before impact, one which ultimately doomed everyone on board. What are you doing? Move forward. 
Investigators are puzzled by something that was said in the cockpit just seconds before the crash. What are you doing? Football! The flight data shows that there was a momentary drop in engine thrust, accompanied by a brief deflection in the elevators. When they synchronize the data with the cockpit recording, a tragic picture emerges. After rolling off the runway, the captain moves his controls to abort the takeoff. The flight engineer follows his lead and decreases engine power. The flight engineer thinks they have aborted, they are going to abort. He sees a clue from the action of the pilot on the yoke and puts the engines to neutral, actually powers down the engines. What are you doing? But the first officer disagrees, and the captain reverses his decision. Full power! He orders the engineer to put the engines back at full power and tries to take off. Running a safe cockpit requires there to be a distinct chain of command, and the captain is in charge. But the problem with YAC services was that the first officer was actually bureaucratically his boss because he was the director of flight services. It was their last chance. Even a momentary hesitation as to who's in charge and whose word goes, that in a case like this uh, can be the moment, the split second when you might have chosen life versus death. Only two months after the crash, investigators release an initial report outlining the causes. The pilot's inadvertent braking is listed as a main cause of the crash. But the real blame, as the accident investigation came to the conclusion properly, in my mind, was that the people who put the crew in that position were the ones to blame. The charter airline Yak service is also severely criticized. The crew was doing things that you could have predicted in advance they would have done. And they were not doing things you could have predicted they wouldn't have done because of the nature of the crew training, their background, their experience, everything that you could expect a pilot to do under those conditions. The sole survivor of the crash, mechanic Alexander Sizov, requires ongoing treatment. He no longer flies. After suffering one of the worst tragedies ever in the history of sport, Yaroslavl Lokomotiv cancels their entire 2011 season. The beauty of the Russian hockey system, I would say, is that they do have a, a great feeder program with those younger kids coming up. Uh, they have a team called Yaroslav II uh, that is the, the next generation that would be ready to make the step. The next year, the team made a triumphant return. Once again, the city of Yaroslavl has hopes of winning the cup. The Lokomotiv fans would also come to understand the true character of their late team captain, Ivan Kachenko. For years, Ivan had been anonymously donating millions of rubles to seriously ill children. Only minutes before takeoff, Kachenko made his last donation to a 16-year-old girl in hospital a girl he had never met. For some, there's hope that the Yaroslavl disaster will lead to safer air travel in Russia. Through my years of playing there, plane crashes were just, oh, Mike, it's, it's, it's Russia. That was the attitude of the players I played with and the organization. It's just Russia. And hopefully, unfortunately, a tragedy like this can hopefully maybe wake some people up. There is a push from the government to uh, clean up the industry from the small operators that are not quite being uh, controlled, if you will, or inspected properly on a regular basis. The crash of Flight 9633 shone a harsh spotlight on commercial aviation in Russia. Many in the industry believe that what's required now is a strong effort to maintain a culture of safety throughout the nation's aviation industry. There's hope we can establish control, but it requires constant vigilance. That's not a, something that procedures can fix. Only a cultural change can fix it. And getting, it, getting that cultural change is devilishly difficult. But if you don't do it, then you pay, you pay a devil's ransom. <laughs>